Good morning, everyone, and uh, we will just start the morning lecture. Uh, there is going to be a set of two lectures which I will uh, do. Uh, the first one that I'm going to do is on diffusion of automation technologies and manufacturing employment in India. Now, I believe that this topic, this is an issue of extreme topical interest because you would have seen that uh, there's a fair amount of discussion on impact of automation on employment. And this discussion has assumed much more importance in the COVID uh, phase, whether you call it post-COVID or living with COVID, this topic has become much more important because uh, the very fact that this lecture itself is taking place through an online medium, um, you know, clearly shows that he, he, there is tremendous possibilities for automation and digital technologies to, uh, you know, diffuse in various activities, not just in the provision of services, but also in manufacturing. And, uh, uh, and for instance, uh, the, uh, the introduction of, uh, so, you know, social distancing, for instance, which will become a kind of a, a new normal, um, you know, which would mean that you would require much less number of people to work in an organization rather than before, uh, so that you, enter, uh, you know, you maintain the, uh, you know, the social distancing in a proper manner. So all this would increase the probability that automation is going to take place much more virulently now than ever before. So we need to have some understanding about its effect on employment, because we are also working in a phase where we are trying to increase employment essentially through the manufacturing road. And because between manufacturing and services, you would find that the, the, uh, the degree of automation is much higher in services rather than in manufacturing. So the, uh, in fact, you can already see that many services are already automated, for instance, uh, uh, online banking, you know, online uh, e-commerce, for instance, and, and so on. But in manufacturing, uh, also if automation is going to diffuse, and if we are thinking that through the manufacturing route, we can increase employment, uh, that also assumes a little bit of, uh, in, uh, you know, doubt uh, under the current circumstances. So the way in which I'm going to do my presentation is, uh, uh, like this. I will first start with uh, the motivation for uh, uh, doing the study. And these motivations can be divided into general motivations in the literature and also very India specific. Okay. And second, I will go into the significance of the research problem, which essentially arises from the motivation. Okay. Then I will ra raise some very clear research questions. And that will lead, lead me to the methodology and the kind of data sources that I have uh, to answer this, uh, those research questions. Then I will have a brief engagement with the literature. You know, the idea is to identify the kind of uh, issues which have come up for discussion uh, in, in, in the relationship between technology, technological change and employment, and then find out some gaps where this research could fill in those. Thereafter, I will start with the empirical analysis of the paper, which will first look at some descriptive data on automation on employment uh, in the world as a whole. And thereafter, I will go very specifically into the Indian case. And then I will end with some uh, discussion on what would be the uh, future scenario. Okay, the future scenario should be seen against the context of two major developments. One which I have already discussed very briefly uh, by way of introduction, that is the uh, uh, this pandemic and well, uh, you know whether you are going to use the term living with COVID or in the post COVID, if at all we can have one in, in the in the foreseeable uh, future, you know automation is likely to be much more, uh, and because many of the things that we have already been automated. Uh, manufacturers will be unwilling to let go of those practices. Okay. Second is the changes in technology itself, and specifically the technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, uh, both of which would also increase the probability for automation to happen much more in the future than now, than at the moment. 
And then I will also say that there are about some eight ancillary technologies, uh, which, which are also growing in a very exponential fashion, which would increase the scope probability for automation in the future. And thereafter, I conclude my presentation. So let me start with the motivation for doing the study. I start with the general motivations. Uh, and the first one is that if you look at the popular discussion which is taking place in the Western world and, um, and, and of late in, even in China and India also, you will find that uh, there is a kind of a, a feeling that uh, robots are coming and they are going to steal jobs uh, of men and, uh, and that's going to lead to uh, many things, one of which will be increasing income inequalities in income distribution. Okay, it will lead to massive technological unemployment. You are already seeing that in the case of the United States to a certain extent, to a certain extent, and in, in some other uh, uh, Western European countries uh, as well. Okay, so technological unemployment. So uh, the narrative is in the form of a robot apocalypse. Robots are coming and they are going to steal jobs. Okay, and in fact, if you click that uh, uh, thing, you can see various uh, articles in New York Times, etc., which actually talks about this specific issue. The second one is that uh, there is a, a small body of literature which has come up primarily in the United States, okay, uh, which actually shows that uh, automation and technologies are responsible for the pure poor wage growth, because rate of growth of wages, have, uh, in, you know, whether it's nominal or real uh, rate of growth of wages, has not been very good. You know. And second is the growing inequality, okay? and especially in, in the US. In the Europe. And that is uh, sort of attributed to, uh, to automation. And both these, the poor wage growth and inequalities, likely to accentuate uh, with more automation going to take place. That's a second reason as to why we need to have a understanding of uh, the relationship between automation and employment. And I must say that uh, this discussion is also taking place in, uh, in major journals. For instance, uh, uh, I make this reference to three articles in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which have come up recently, where there is actually a symposium on this uh, particular topic. And recent research by Asimoglu and Restropo on the effects of industrial robots on US job market has also uh, you know, added to this uh, narrative because they have sort of estimated based on data that the density of robots, if you increase that by one, that is the number of robots per unit of uh, employed persons, that will reduce the employment to population ratio by 0 0.25 percentage points. Okay, so there is a that, that's a kind of a negative relationship. Increased use of robots uh, or uh, robot is taken as a proxy for automation. Okay, And I, I'll later on deal with all these concepts because there is some amount of uh, you know, confusion in what you mean by automation because it is not one particular type of technology. There's a range of technologies which are involved and the labor displacing effects of each of those technologies can vary quite significantly. Now people equate uh, automation with robots because robot is basically the highest form of automation because robots can do uh, uh, practically most of the physical operations which a man can do or a, or a human being can do. Okay, So that's why uh, the, uh, the, uh, the term uh, automation and robots are taken somewhat synonymously in the literature. Okay. Then more recent uh, 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 data has actually shown that uh, just the opposite, you know, automation doesn't really displace labor, and uh, but it may reduce the share of wages in value added. Now you would have seen this discussion of share of wages in value added going down uh, in in uh, the world as a whole. If you take the share of wages in value added, that's been declining. And in fact, later on, I will, I will say that in, even in India, uh, this has been declining. Although in the most recent past, there has been a slight increase in the share of wages in value added as far as India is concerned, if you use that annual survey of industries data. 
So those are the kind of a, a general motivation for doing the study because there is a kind of a robot apocalypse kind of a feeling, an inverse relationship between the use of robots and employment. More robots are going to be used, less employment will take place, and that's bad. And the share of wages in value added is actually going down and growing inequalities and, and, uh, and, and so on. Okay. All, all of which are very bad for economic growth in the future. The second is motivations which are very specific to India. And as we know that in our own country, we have been placing much emphasis on raising employment through the manufacturing road. So in the previous government, we had the manufacturing strategy and in the new government, which is currently in power, we have the uh, uh, Make in India program. Both were uh, you know, aiming to have uh, the share of manufacturing in GDP to rise up to about 25% by this year. Okay, and if you look at the data, uh, we have not reached up to that level. We are only about 70 to 18 percent, uh, you know, but the, the aim of the government is basically to raise the share of uh, manufacturing uh, to at least a quarter of the GDP and, uh, uh, you know, by in, in the foreseeable future, uh, you know, 20, 2020 was taken, but now 2020 has already happened and but this has not happened, but Nevertheless, this is the, basically the target. And in fact, the recently announced Atma Nirpur package by the, gov uh, the government also seeks to, if you look at the fourth package that was announced, you will see that the government uh, is wanting to improve uh, the, uh, uh, about eight critical sectors in the economy. Okay, so manufacturing uh, raising employment through the manufacturing route is one of the most important planks of government policy, you know, uh, for a fairly long period of time. But researchers have actually seen a steady decline in the labor intensity of manufacturing and, and also what is referred to as a jobless growth. Now, I don't refer to this jobless growth literature that much because that's pretty well known, I think, now, uh, in the sense that there is growth happening, but uh, employment is not growing at the same rate at which economic growth is happening okay that's a jobless growth there is a fair amount of literature i'm sure you would be you would have already been referred to uh, in some of the lectures but what is not that much known is that if you take the traditional labor intensive manufacturing sectors in india for instance cotton textiles for instance leather manufacturing for instance uh, uh, you know paper manufacturing and not uh, you know hand paper manufacturing uh, and uh, and you you take you name any kind of traditional uh, labor intensive manufacturing in fact these others have actually taken about 13 different traditionally labor intensive manufacturing sectors and they looked at the the uh, the labor intensity of those labor intensive manufacturing sectors and they find that it has actually gone down in other words even traditional labor intensive manufacturing sectors in india have been becoming much more capital intensive. The capital here would mean using more machines than, than uh, human beings, okay? human, labor, human labor. Okay, So that's uh, another important uh, reason as to why we need to have some understanding about the relationship between automation and employment. Second is that, uh, the third reason is that manufacturing employment growth has been showing considerable year-to-year -year fluctuations. You don't find any kind of uh, a kind of a secular increase in manufacturing employment and that has been uh, the the feature so whether you take uh, if you take the asi the annual survey of industries data by the way when i'm talking about the manufacturing sector i refer to the annual survey of industries sector you know what that means that is the factory sector which employs uh, factories which employs at least eight, 10 persons and working with power electricity and if you don't use electricity, at least employing 20 persons. So all those units which are above those two thresholds are referred to as the ASI uh, factory sector. And when I'm referring to the manufacturing sector, I'm basically referring to that sector. Okay. So if you take the number of workers, you know, one of the ASI characteristics is the number of workers. And you get that from the uh, annual survey of industries. And uh, if someone is interested, you can just get into the website of MOSPI, the Ministry of uh, um, you know, Statistics and Program Implementation, 
and uh, there you will find the summary results of the factory sector over a very long period of time. The latest data is available for 2017-18. Okay, so you can get the uh, data on the number of workers, and if you compute the rate of growth of the number of workers, um, you know, over a very long period of time from the 1980s until 2017-18, you find mere fluctuations. A considerable year to year fluctuations, no increase at all. Okay. Fourth thing is that, as, as, as I just mentioned briefly before, the share of wages in value added has been steadily declining. It used to be roughly in the region of about 26%. The share of wages in value added was something like 26%, let's say in the 1980s, and now it has come down to a figure which is close to about 10%. Of course, as I said, in the more recent period, it has gone up to about 15% uh, or so. In fact, I will just uh, uh, show you that data. So this is the, this is that data that you I just referred to. Okay, so you can see that it's about 26% in the 1980s, and it's, it has come down to about 13%. In fact, it had come down to about 10% during the um, during the uh, global financial crisis period, and after that, for some reason, it has been showing an increase. In fact, I've been talking to my colleagues who have been working in this area. They've been unable to give me an explanation as to why that has been, uh, that's the case. Okay. So, uh, uh, so that I think is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, these are the India specific reasons. And then COVID-19, as I, I was mentioning, is also expected to speed up the rate of automation, both in manufacturing and services. And we have already seen that happening in services in a very fairly large scale. And many of those uh, practices which we are now getting used to may remain in force even when the COVID has uh, disappeared or its negative effects have been lessened. So these are the kind of a specific India-specific motives for looking at the relationship between automation and employment. Okay. Now, uh, the significance of the, 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 uh, the topic. Okay. So for that, uh, let me go into, uh, first of all, a late manufacturing country, because see, as I said, the share of ma our manufacturing sector is extremely small. When I say manufacturing sector is extremely small, the metric that is used for, do, uh, you know, for stating that is basically the, uh, the share of manufacturing in our GDP, which is only about 17%. And if you knock off the formal from that, uh, you know, total share, the, because the total share would include formal and some informal. So if you knock off the formal, the formal manufacturing sector may be about 10 or 11% of the uh, GDP of the country. Okay. So for a late manufacturing countries, you know, and, and as I said, recently, we are beginning with the manufacturing strategy and now the Make in India program we see that there has been a tremendous emphasis which is placed both at the national government and also at the sub-national government within specific states to, uh, uh, to increase the size of the manufacturing sector. So you would have, here, you would have been uh, reading about this discussion on, uh, for instance, uh, ease of doing business, growth of startups, etc., and so on. All these are ways in which the government is trying to increase the size of the manufacturing sector of our economy okay so if you are going to have a manufacturing industry now this manufacturing industry can skip stages and start with the latest manufacturing or process technologies which are all based on automation okay so if you are going to put up a automotive plant right now you may or a you know electronics manufacturing now as you know with our political problem with china we are now talking in terms of reducing our dependence on China for imports. And if you look at the data, we will find that uh, a lot of the things that we are actually importing from China are basically technology intensive goods, such as electronics, telecommunications, mobile, uh, you know, of which mobile phones and so on are uh, very important. And if you are going to set up a mobile phone factory, for instance, now, and you will, you will basically be going into the latest technologies, which are all automation. Auto, you know, based on automation, okay? And think about electric vehicles, which are also now the government is now trying to promote. Electric vehicles are 
there are very few moving parts in an electric vehicle and so they that can also be you know very much prone to automation so uh, you know india can skip stages and go to the latest uh, so if you look at all the recent factories which have come up in india you would find that they are highly automated you know much more automated than uh, you know uh, uh, what is but again the term automation should be used and i will come back to that uh, in, uh, to, to to an interrogation of that term uh, a little bit later also okay so uh, uh, so you can skip, skip stages and go to the latest uh, uh, technologies so that's a, uh, that's a, uh, one significance of this issue in the uh, indian context the second one is that according to estimates by various ma management consultants and one of the most respected management consultancy organization is the boston consulting group and they say that use of robots can actually reduce decrease labor costs by as much as 16% so that was a kind of uh, uh, you know by as much as 16% so that is uh, uh, so you can uh, uh, you can and especially when manufacturing plants are operating in a regime of uh, uh, extreme external competitiveness now you want to increase your external competitiveness so you need to bring down your cost of production uh, very much and uh, and automation is one way in which you can actually uh, reduce uh, and uh, and uh, third is basically developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning you know this is something which we have completely underestimated we never thought that artificial artificial intelligence will explode in the way in which it has done in the last 2 3 years nobody ever predicted in fact let me also tell you nobody ever predicted the growth of the internet in the way in which it is now uh, exploded you won't find any kind of uh, you know although you have all kinds of laws uh, which people have talked about but they never talked about the uh, phenomenal explosion of broadband now we are talking about 5g uh, which will even accentuate Uh, you know the use of internet for wide variety of operations in the future so the, the the artificial intelligence and machine learning you know many tasks which we thought could not be you know uh, and i will talk about this task and occupation again a little bit later because many when you talk about an occupation it is composed of number of tasks okay so uh, in a broad occupation not all tasks can be automated earlier but now those things also can be automated now because of the development of so uh, the, the next one is see the next reason as to why this problem is, uh, is see when we talk about robots and so on you feel that it is only something which big firms can adopt because of the cost involved you know and, and it's not like going to a, a you know a shop and buying a computer okay because computer is also a kind of an automation uh, technology so Uh, but what you find is that there has been a tremendous fall in the, the price of robots okay this has been estimated so if you take uh, you know the uh, an index this is this data refers only to the united states okay and that can be taken as a sort of a proxy for the world and and um, and, and what you find is that there is a tremendous the labor costs have been going up but the robot prices have been going down okay and if in fact if you look at the uh the price of a full robotic system now it is well within the reach of even medium and small scale industries so the time is not too far away when even when msmes uh, which are traditionally thought about as labor intensive manufacturing operations they will also uh, have a, um, you know they will also be adopting robots okay so price of robots or automation technologies have been going down and for instance in our own country i was very surprised to see that there are eight major manufacturers of industrial robots all the major world's largest manufacturers of industrial robots have set up their own factories you know in in pune in in bangalore in gurgaon uh, uh, you know these areas okay and so it is and they have set up factories here because the demand as i will show you later is increasing here in quite fast okay uh, and i i don't use the term exponential but they are growing very fast uh, okay. and uh, with the result that they don't need to 
import these items, but they can actually uh, produce them here. Okay. And uh, so for all these reasons, what I'm trying to tell you is that time is not too far away when even our MSME sectors, uh, you know, will start using robots and that will be also a bad news for employment uh, creation. So that's the significance of this research problem that you need to look at. So what are the research questions? So that I have uh, three research questions. The first one is, what is the rate of diffusion of automation technologies in India's manufacturing sector? So that's the first one, okay? Fairly straightforward and clear question. The second one is, uh, what is the diffusion of automation and its effect on manufacturing employment? So if you have automation, does it necessarily lead to, as some of the others have earlier said, uh, to reduction of manufacturing employment? And that will be uh, uh, now, Based on the tenor of my speaking so far, you may be surprised as to why I'm asking that question at all, because uh, naturally with uh, the price of uh, automation technologies getting reduced significantly over a period of time, more firms, new, newer firms coming on, uh, on the scene and they adopting these new technologies. So naturally there will be a negative effect, but that's not that straightforward, okay? And, and, I, and I will argue that uh, with data a little later. Okay. Then I'll talk about the likely trends in diffusion, which I kept on emphasizing, because in the, even if I find that the effect of automation on employment is not that negative right now, but in future, it can be a different kettle of fish altogether. Okay? It can be a different situation altogether. In fact, uh, in, in future, there can be you know, there, there can be a tremendous possibility of automation reducing employment. And we are already beginning to see some signs of that uh, in, the, in the manufacturing sector. So what's the methodology and data sources? Okay, the, the study is based entirely on secondary source material. And, I, the, and the secondary source that I use is basically the annual survey of surveys of the International Federation of Robotics. Now, this uh, um, is, uh, let me just show you the, just quickly show you the, so this is the International Federation of Robotics. You can get, it, get into that uh, database, but of course you don't uh, always see, okay, you, uh, you always don't see that, uh, uh, you know all the data there, okay. And, and what are the what are the specific features of this database? This annual survey of robot use. First of all, it covers thirty two countries, and the good news is that it covers India, okay. And second, it presents industry wise and country wise annual and time series data on the number of robots which are delivered, which are that's so that is the flow of robots. Okay, and second, it also has the operational stock of robots. That is the number of robots which are already installed inside the factory. Okay, it also offers data on task-wise distribution of robots within occupations. So, um, you, you know, you have broad occupations and which are equivalent to broad industry sectors. Occupations are in the, equivalent to industry sectors. And within those industry sectors, what are the kind of uh, tasks for which these robots are uh, being used, okay? And for calculating the operational stock, okay, they, uh, this data source assumes that the average life of a robot is 12 years, and after that it is uh, immediately withdrawn from the uh, period. Now, the reason as to why I am emphasizing this thing about operational stock, because then the, uh, if you want to look at the effect on employment, you can't use a flow data, okay? You cannot use the data on number of robots which are actually sold during a year because there will be already num a, 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 a number of robots which are already existing in the uh, factory, you know? And, and, and so that's why you need to have uh, operational stock. So they use this 12 year thing as the, as the kind of, uh, so it's a very good quality data uh, base now, uh, the only thing that we used to have in India uh, was the census of machine tool manufacturing. Okay, we had a census here, 
of machine tools which are used inside factories. You know what are machine tools? These are machines which are used for making machines. Okay, and uh, for instance, a lathe which is used for making uh, parts of a machine. So that that will be a machine tool. Okay, and, and so we had actually basically a census of this during the mid 1980s. And after that, we never had any uh, uh, such census. So we don't have this kind of a database as far as India is concerned, and so. On. Second, this data has been published since 2006. The latest edition is 2019, which has got data up to 2018. Okay. And the data is internationally com comparable because the same definition is used across countries. So what do you mean by robot in India is the same as what's uh, in China or in the United States or in Germany. Okay. So it's the data is internationally comparable. Provides data on the density of robots. So the number of robots per employment can be worked out in the industry and also tasks within industries where these installations are available. Okay. For India, the data on operational stock is available since uh, 1999, but industry specific data is available only since 2006. So for all practical purposes, we have data only from 2006 onwards up to 2018. And task specific data, unfortunately, is available only from 2011 onwards. Okay. And the source of data on employment used for computing the density of robots is not always mentioned in this data source. So I, I, I so one cannot use that because we don't know what is the definition of employment uh, th that is used. Because I find that the uh, data on employment which is given in this data source is very different from the uh, employment data that is available from the annual survey industry. So as far as India is concerned. I take the, for employment, I take the data which is provided in the annual survey of industries. And those who are familiar with that, you, you know there are two uh, uh, types of data on employment. One is the workers, and second is the total persons engaged. Okay, so I take the total persons engaged because automation can also affect the, of, uh, the administrative wings of a factory. Okay. So that's, uh, so that's basically the data source. It's basically a annual survey of robot use by IFR. And I managed to get access to this database. Uh, so un unfortunately, I have the data only up to 2016. 17 and 18, I don't have for India, but I have access to that for the other areas. Now I move on to the, uh, the engagement with the literature on the topic, okay? So uh, this engagement of the literature, uh, you normally refer to this as a review of literature in any, uh, any scientific paper, okay? So you do this uh, engagement to find out the kind of issues which people have studied so that you can identify a gap and place your research in that gap, okay? So that should be the idea of a, uh, of a uh, engagement with the literature. And I hate to see these reviews of literature which are all the specific. What X said, Y said, Z said. And very often in one sentence and then the names of these others in brackets. Okay. And you never find the gap in issues clearly identified. Okay. So it has to be a issue specific engagement and not an author specific engagement, which is normally encountered in many papers. So when you look at the issues which have come up for discussion in the automation literature, you can, you can see two phases. One is the phase one, and that phase began in the 1980s. Okay, in fact, there is only one study that I can think of that was published in, which is the Kenneth Flam study of 1988. And I will refer to this study because this is a very important study as far as uh, uh, automation is concerned, but unfortunately not being used in the robot ap apocalypse literature, which started from 2013 with the publication of a very influential study by two Oxford authors, uh, Carl Benedict Frey and Michael Osborne. Okay, it's known as the Frey and Osborne study of 2013, which is a very, very highly cited study. But later on, I will say, that if you use Google Scholar, you will find that the study has been cited 6,600 times. Okay, 
2013 was basically the uh, uh, basically the working paper version of the study and 2017 it became a kind of a journal article in the technology forecasting and and uh, uh, change journal okay and, and uh, so that's uh, uh, those are the two phases so the 1980s until and then the 90 2013 onwards in fact it is this Frey and Osborne study which has actually rekindled our interest in a relationship between technology and employment growth okay although neoclassical economists have been talking in a very theoretical sense about technology and employment and you know and we also have discussion of technological unemployment even in case etc and so on but the real effect between you know of automation and uh, uh, you know employment okay. now this publication of the study uh, this now later on I will refer to this FO. FO means Frey and Osborne study. Unleash a wave of concern about the deleterious effect on uh, automation because this study has, I mean, I will, I will talk a little bit more about the study a little later. Okay, so that's the study which has actually rekindled or renewed our interest in automation and employment. The Kenneth Lang study is hardly cited by anyone, uh, and, 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 uh, but I feel that's a very important. Basically, because it is a chapter of a book and not a journal article, and so that may be one of the reasons as to why it's been. You know, chapters of books get less cited than journal articles. You know, and so that's that may be one of the reasons as to why it's been. You know, but I think anyone who's doing a work on this must start with, uh, because Flam is using a similar kind of data that I'm using, so we have some ideas about the the kind of effect of. Uh, uh, robots on manufacturing employment during the 70s and 80s in, in the Western capitalist world, which is basically the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. Uh, okay. And then we can see, now we have the more recent data, we can, then we can see, we can track some changes, whether, you know, uh, automation has led to more employment being negatively affected and so on. We can look, look at that in a historical fashion, you know, and not just at a cross-section because a lot of the econometric work is basically cross-section studies at a particular point in time. So it doesn't answer the question, how is it becoming over a period of time? Okay. And uh, so that's a, that's a kind of thing that we, we have to bear in mind. So this first phase two kind of studies beginning with the FO study, okay, can be broadly classified into three cells. First one simply analyzes diffusion of industrial robots in a range of countries. Okay. Second set shows an inverse relationship between the extent of diffusion and automation uh, um, in manufacturing. So now I've already referred to one of them, okay, which shows you know, higher use of robots will lead to a reduction in employment. They have made some estimates. And, and you know, so like for instance, the density goes by one, you know, the employment to population ratio will go down by 0.25%. I just referred to those kind of elasticity comparisons, okay? Third set shows increased automation has not really resulted in hefty job losses. And most of these studies are actually in the services sector. For instance, uh, you know, uh, has automation in the banking sector led to reduction of employment in the banking sector? Okay, so this is a kind of a, uh, kind of a question which has been, because you have more ATMs, automatic teller machines, which are uh, now, and you have online banking, but has that really led to a reduction of employment in the banking sector? Okay, some studies which have actually done, not in India, but in the West, especially in the United States, have actually shown that it is not. In fact, total employment has actually increased. And, uh, and I'll explain to you why that is so and so. Okay. So I will start first with the FLAM study of diffusion of robots. You know, uh, so I take the phase one and I look at the FLAM study. His survey focused on, his survey covers the periods 1970 to 84 and covers the, uh, the following countries. So basically Western Europe, United States and Japan. Okay. And he focused on two issues, how and where industrial robots were being used in manufacturing and how robot use in the United States compared with manufacturing practices abroad. Now, I'm not very much interested in robot use in the United States compared with manufacturing practices abroad. 
for Kenneth Flam, that was important because, uh, you, you know, that's what he was interested in. I'm not interested in uh, uh, that aspect. But I would like to know how and where industrial robots are being used in manufacturing. What are the kind of industries and tasks for which uh, robots are being used? Okay. So what are the significant, uh, you know, findings of the FLAM study, which are relevant for us? Okay. The first one is that the robots use which was, uh, you know, relatively small numbers, and they were basically used in areas which are hazardous and unpleasant operations, especially those which are associated with metal processing. Now, labor economists use the term occupational hazards. There are certain operations where occupational hazards are very high. And, and so you tend to use machines uh, uh, to perform those tasks where occupational hazards are very high. Okay. And in fact, one of the... Uh, uh, one of the things that, and this actually started in Japan, in the auto automotive factories of Japan, because as you know, Japan, uh, uh, you know, caught up with the rest of the world. So Japan is an example of a country which has actually caught up with the uh, rest of the world. When you use catch up, you know, in the catch up literature, what do you mean by catch up? When would you say that a country has caught up? Um, like uh, when you use the term catch up, okay, what is the metric which is used for measuring that? Okay, uh, see the metric that is used for measuring that is basically the average level of per capita income. So Japan is one of those countries which have actually caught up with the rest of the world essentially because its per capita income caught up with the Western world. Okay. And the main instrument or route through which they did that was developing certain specific manufacturing industries. First, the auto, automotive industry, and second, the electronics industry. Okay, both, both these industries were very, very essential for Japan to catch up. And in that catch up process, they wanted to become, because when you have, uh, you know, Toyota and Nissan and so on coming up in an area where in, a, in, a, in, a, in the world when you already have well entrenched Western manufacturers, you know, Ford, General Motors, etc., and so on. The only way in which they could catch up was in terms of reducing the cost of production. And they began to use robots. But robots were basically used, uh, so robots were basically used to improve the external competitiveness of the automotive industry, but they were used essentially in hazardous and unpleasant operations within the assembly line. And these were basically welding and painting, mostly welding, okay? And within welding, it was basically not all kinds of welding, but basically spot welding and arc welding because the spot welding and arc welding uses a fair amount of energy and uh, and a fair amount of heat is generated, and that's very, very hazardous for uh, uh, the for the welder. Okay, so that's where robots were basically used. Okay, so uh, and then uh, uh, with Japan using these robots, it immediately you know started uh, uh, diffusing into other other uh, uh, places. Okay. And again, the industrial robot use has not increased consistently, but it has uh, in fits and starts. Okay, so one year it will go up, the next year it will come down, and 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 so on. So it is not as if it is a kind of a secular increase in the use of uh, thing. But the major use of these robots was basically restricted to the automotive industry and within the automotive industry to welding, and within welding it is arc welding and spot welding. So please keep that at the back of your mind because, uh, uh, and then you see after some time, uh, uh, you know, there have been some slight diversification in the use of robots in electronics where you have repetitive jobs being done which doesn't require mass cognitive power. For instance, uh, you know, uh, assembling components on a circuit board you know, the same item is placed in the same area in a board, so you can actually use a, 
a, a machine rather than a, you know, a man, because uh, this is an area where the, uh, the, uh, the employee fatigue will be very high and, and, and so they can make mistakes and, and so on. So you can use some robots for that. So, so if you have an automotive and electronics industry in your manufacturing sector, you tend to use a lot of robots, okay? Because they can uh, increase the, uh, uh, the, you know, the competitiveness of your industry and also replace uh, uh, human beings with machines for hazardous occupations like functions welding. So that's the, Kenneth, the major uh, finding of the Kenneth Flam. It is basically restricted to the automotive industry and within the automotive industry restricted to tasks such as welding and within the free endorsement study which was uh, came up. See, this study is very uh, badly quoted. First of all, when, what they free at Osborne meant as automation was computerization. And, okay? and what they did was they estimated the probability of computerization of 702 detailed occupations using a Gaussian process classifier okay, in the United States. Now that is being referred to as they having studied in, a, in actuality 702 industries across the world and reaching a conclusion. So it is basically a, what they have done is they simply worked out the probabilities of 702 occupations getting computerized, not automated in the fullest sense of the term. Okay. And they came to the conclusion that about 47% of the total US employment is at risk. Now this study has been quoted in a very vulgar fashion by a number of people, including some people in India, which then came up with a number, 63% of the jobs in India are going to be automated. You know, if you do a Google search, you will find articles in Economic Times, you know, in the 2013, 14, 14, 15 time, okay? where they say, come up with the 63%. Now, where on earth they got the 63%? Nobody knows, okay? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the Frey and Osborne study is not really a study about automation. Strictly speaking, it's the study about probability of computerization, okay? The study has, uh, you, know, uh, it, you know, because of the very high citation, everyone who uh, does a paper on this, will cite the study, okay? So, uh, as I said before, Google Scholar has picked up some 6,600 uh, citations. It's growing on a daily basis, okay? Much of the study has been misinterpreted. I told you probabilities have been, uh, you, know, can't, uh, you know, misinterpreted as actual, uh, you know, actual study of automation. Automation has been defined only in terms of computerization. And they considered only broad occupations and not tasks within occupations. And, uh, and, and and so on. So I think, uh, uh, and if you want to be, see a very uh, nice critic of this study, uh, I've given uh, this uh, uh, study by two Australian authors, which has come up just last year. So you can have a look at that uh, for the detailed. Uh, the next one is the Asimoglu and Restropo study, which uh, the issue which they have actually studied is something which I already referred to. They found, they looked at the US labor market between 1990 and 2007. They defined automation in terms of robots, okay? And they uh, tend to say that, but again, looked at only broad occupations, broad industries, not tasks within. And they tried to say that uh, uh, there is a kind of a negative effect of automation on employment and, and on wages, okay? So this basically raises this critical point about task and occupations. If you really want to study the effect of automation on employment, you need task-wise data. Because broad occupations contain number of tasks within those. For instance, if you are uh, uh, occupation of being wo a worker in an automotive factory, depends on where exactly you are employed. So for instance, if you are employed in performing tasks like welding or painting, the probability of uh, automation negatively affecting your employment is much higher uh, than 
in certain other kinds of occupations uh, and so on. In fact, I got exactly this uh, about a year ago, uh, two years ago, I visited the factory of uh, Toyota, okay, in, in Nagoya, which is, uh, you know, the Toyota is headquartered in uh, the province of uh, uh, Nagoya, okay, uh, in Japan. And I was told, and this factory will run into several football fields. Before I went to the factory, I was told that there will not, you will not find any single human being inside the factory. But when I went to the factory, I found that it has come, you know, in fact, we were only taken to one, as, one uh, uh, aspect of the factory, which is the final assembly of the car. Okay. And we found there were so many people that the visitors were actually taken through a kind of a bridge, which was built inside the factory. So, so that we don't uh, walk through the uh, factory floor uh, because there's so many things are moving around you know, people moving around, forklift trucks moving around, and, and, and so on. So what I found was that there, there were a lot of people working inside that factory, contrary to what I heard that, you know, a huge football field with not a single soul to be seen, et cetera, and so on. So all this talk about, you know, people disappearing and so on, certain, because the task that I was looking at was basically assembling where still a lot of people, that's where all the parts of the car were assembled and the final car is rolled out. Okay, so already it is painted, welded, etc. and so on. So that's the, uh, the, you know, only the inside things and so on were uh, put. So, you know, so that portion is not at all automated at all. So it depends on the task. So you need that task. Otherwise, you will exaggerate the effect of automation on employment as many others have actually done. Okay. So the, what are the main conclusions that can be uh, uh, drawn from this very brief, quick review of uh, the NKJ? Now, I, I don't go into the, all the other studies because many of the studies are similar in nature. See, that's why I'm trying to say, if you do an issue specific thing, you know, because if you say, for instance, if you take uh, the literature on FDI, effect of FDI spillovers on, uh, you know, on, on FDI on technology spillovers, you will find millions of, uh, millions may be an exaggeration, but you will find large number of studies, okay? But you find that most of the studies are of uh, the same nature, okay? They use basically the same kind of data or same, uh, the same research question and uh, uh, maybe even the same country. And, and you know, so they don't, uh, so one, they, you know, if you do an author specific thing, you tend to include studies which are of very similar in nature and you don't get really anything substantial out of that kind of an engagement. Okay. So uh, this, it shows that uh, industrial robots are used in specific industries such automobile, electrical and electronics and metal working industries because of the occupational hazard and so on. And even within these industries, they are used for certain tasks like spot and arc welding and uh, uh, their usage does not seem to have diffused into other manufacturing industries over the last four decades. Now, this is an important point, and I will pick up this point with data later. later. Okay, and uh, and many of the studies which have looked at the relationship between diffusion of automation and employment, they've got opposite results. So, which one to believe? Okay, some have got negative relationship, inverse relationship. Some have got no relationship at all. So, which one to believe? Same thing with uh, FDI spillover studies also. Some shows positive spillovers of FDI. Some shows negative spillovers. Most studies shows no relationship at all. So what's the policy conclusion that you can actually draw? Now, will this kind of studies will allow you to draw any kind of evidence-based policy? Okay, whether you should use, uh, 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 whether you should have a policy on automation or not. And I would say that it doesn't allow you, okay? And the proxy that is used for identifying auto automation has varied across studies. Some have defined in terms of computerization, like the famous FO, FO study. Others, I, in, uh, you know, in terms of use of industrial robots, et cetera, and so on. And all studies without any exception has, uh, you know, restricted developed countries and you don't find any study as far as uh, India and so on is concerned. So you need to have that. So uh, uh, based on this conclusions of the, if, engagement of the literature, you need to have a kind of uh, conceptual clarity. Okay. 
So the conceptual clarity that you need to have is, uh, first of all, uh, um, you know, there is a range of manufacturing technology where a specific task can be performed without the aid of a work. I refer to the use of a forklift truck, which is used for transporting things within, inside a factory or a conveyor belt. But the labor displace, displacing effects of each of those technology can vary significantly. Okay. And the highest form of automation from the point of view of displacement of labor, because that's what we are interested in, is the use of multi-purpose industrial robots. And for industrial robots, we need to have operational stock and not just the annual flow of robots, the number of robots which are sold, because there are already robots which are installed inside the factory, okay, which can also displace labor. And we, we require that data industry-wise and task-wise within those industries. Okay. And we require this data for unit of employed persons. And the metric, the, the density figure that we, the literature has used is for 10,000 employed persons. Now, why 10,000? You can, you can measure it 1,000 or uh, 1 million. That doesn't really matter. 10,000 is taken because that's just a convention. Okay. So there is no scientific rigor attached to that figure of 10,000. So now I'll go to the next part, which is basically the empirical data. So the annual installation of industri industrial robots in the world have shown a tremendous increase, you know. So it has gone up from 178,000 to about 584,000. You can see a very major increase in the, and the data for 2020, 21, and 22, the asterisk, these are estimated increases, okay. So the actual data is only up to, to 2019, okay, and you can see that uh, uh, between 2017 to 2019, the growth has been a uh, little bit plateaued, and I have no explanation for why that's the case. Now, where are these robots used? If you have three broad groups, Asia, Europe, and America, and you can see that most of the robots are actually used in Asia, okay, and I'll, I'll give you and, uh, the, uh, and you can see that the robot use in Asia has been increasing, you know, over a period of time, whereas in the case of Europe and America has not been uh, rising to that extent. And I will uh, explain this in terms of the geography of the change in the geography of, geography of certain industries. Now, who are the largest market? Where are the, uh, the uh, which are the countries which are the largest markets for uh, uh, robots? Now, it's such a surprising thing that China is the largest market for industrial robots. Okay. Now in China, you are always referring to industry, you know, manufacturing firms going into, in fact, some Indian firms have also gone into China, you know, and uh, to, to invest in China because of the labor arbitrage, because of the wages being low in China. Okay. But that was something uh, several years ago. With the demand for manufacturing increase and China becoming a world's factory, okay, the demand for labor has increased. And given the demographic profile of China, that has led to nominal wages, and I'm, and I'm sorry, uh, even real wages in China increasing, industrial wages in increasing. So they began to use robots as a way of remaining competitive. Otherwise, uh, uh, manufacturing jobs in China will move to other countries. Manufacturing operation uh, will move to other countries. Like for instance, some has already moved to uh, countries like Vietnam, for instance. Okay. And now we are thinking in terms of getting some of some, some of those uh, uh, FDI from China into India and so on. So for China to remain competitive in years to come, they have invested very massively in the use of robots. So you can see the difference between the number of uh, uh, in, uh, you know, annual installations, this, this data is for 2018, okay, this year, and so on. India comes uh, uh, 11th or so uh, with about 4,800 uh, robots. This is annual installations, not the operational stock, okay, annual installations. Okay. And, and uh, India has more robots than Singapore, Canada, Thailand, and Czech Republic. Now, do you have, if when you go through this list of countries, does anything come to your mind? Why these 15 countries are the largest 
market. All of them are automobile or electronics manufacturing. Electronics, yeah. uh, you know, check China, automotive and electronics. Electronics is uh, in China. Electronics is more important than automotive. Japan, both. United States, both. Korea, both. Germany, both. All the major car companies in Europe are based in Germany. China's uh, Taiwan, Chinese Taipei is Ch Taiwan. Is a major electronics. You know all the notebook computers and, and so on are there. Italy is a, uh, basically a car. Fiat is home to Italy. France also has car and electronics. Mexico, automotive. Spain, automotive. India, automotive industry is growing very fast in India. It's one of the fastest growing manufacturing sectors. Okay, Singapore, electronics. Canada, again uh, both. Thailand. Major manufacturer of auto parts, you know, it's the auto parts capital of uh, Asia. Czech Republic, also automotive. You know, this uh, car which we have in India, I don't know, I just forget the name of that. Um, you know, which be belongs to the Volkswagen Group. We have that, uh, um, anyway, Skoda, Skoda, you know, Skoda is uh, a Czech car, you know, so within Western Europe. Uh, you know, Czech Republic is a major car manufacturing country. So that's the reason as to why uh, the uh, the uh, the installation of uh, um, 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 robots are very high. Now here, I, uh, you, you know, gives you the industry wise, and you will find that uh, uh, industry wise installations are very high in automotive, and then electronics and electrical industry, and then metals and machinery. Other industries are not at all important. Okay, so these are the so if you, if your economy has these industries, you are likely to use a lot of robots. Okay, so that's the point. And in fact, if you look at the robotic technology, okay, and you know who are the major creators of robotic technology? Okay, if you look through this list, uh, you know Toyota, Robert Bosch, Nissan, Honda, Hyundai, Daimler, Denso, Ford. Uh, you know, BMW, Volkswagen, Daimler, Chrysler, and so on. So all of them are automotive manufacturers or electronics companies. So in other words, there is a, a it is the automotive manufacturers which requires a lot of robots, and they are also the major creators of robots. So a lot of the robots are also manufactured by, although you have exclusive robot manufacturing firms, like I refer to seven or eight exclusive robot. Most of the, uh, uh, the, the, the in, because a lot of these is self-consumption. Tata Motors makes a lot of robots which it then consumes itself. Okay, it doesn't sell it to others. So it doesn't come out as a major manufacturer of, uh, of uh, uh, robots, but it uh, is also very, so uh, a lot of the robots, because users can, when users are the creators of the new technology, they can create technologies in the way in which they are able to then create uh, robots for the purposes for which they want. Okay, so so the robot the, the technologies which are being devel developed is providing to the demand. You know, it's based on the demand for this uh, thing. Now, task wide ro robotic stocks. Unfortunately, you don't have the data for the whole world, but you have data for China. I'm using China as a proxy for the world because I showed you <coughs> that most of the operational stock of robots is now in China. Okay. And they are used basically in handling operations and in welding. Okay. And the data are given for three time points. And so basically they are used for handling and welding and a little bit for assembling. So these are the three major tasks for which robots are used across the world. Okay. And then, of course, if you look at the operational stock of industrial robots, uh, that has also been, uh, and this, this, this data, now I'm moving to the Indian uh, situation. And you can see that there is, there is a major increase in the, uh, in the operational stock of industrial robots, which are actually, I should have put India here. Okay. So uh, from the world, world data, the conclusions that I've drawn is basically, again, what was drawn by Kenneth Flan. Usage is restricted to 
largely restricted to the automotive industry and maybe some diversification into electronics uh, 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 and electrical industry. And within the automotive industry, it is basically handling the materials and also welding and then assembly. Okay. And, and then this is the number of uh, operational stock of robots in India. So it just started from 250. So these are the numbers. So it just started from as low as 250 was a stock of robots. And it has now gone up to about 23,000. So you can see a kind of a, a phenomenal increase which has been happening. Okay. And this is very ne neatly correlated with the growth of our automotive uh, industry as, uh, as such. Okay. And in fact, uh, uh, robot installations in India grew by 39% in 2018 compared to 2017. Okay. This is installations, not operational stock. The previous data actually talked about. Now, the reason as to why I am not able to show you detailed data on because I don't have access to that database at the moment. I only uh, uh, data to 2016. Okay. So uh, if you take 2013 to 18, there is a 20% compound average annual growth. Industry-wise distribution, same as what Kenneth Flam or same as what we have seen in the case of world, majority of the, so this shaded portion, Majority of this actually refers to the automotive industry. Okay, so in fact, almost all the robots which are installed in India are in the in in the uh, automotive industry and some in the plastics and chemical products industries. Okay, so I would imagine that again it is used in uh, hazardous operations in this plastics and chemical products industries. Otherwise, it's largely in the automotive industry. Us, because we don't have a electronics manufacturing industry worth the name in our country. Okay, so that's why electronics industry is not coming out as a major. Now, if you look at uh, the task price distribution of industrial robots uh, between 2011 and 16, these are percentage shares okay, uh, of the total share. Handling, welding, and handling and welding typically accounts for uh, majority of the things. So just like what Kenneth Flam or what we have found for uh, the world data. Okay. And within that, you can see that arc welding and spot welding account for a, uh, you know, significant proportion. So that prom prompts to say that robots are used essentially in the automotive industry, but only for uh, largely used in the automotive industry and within the automotive industry for arc welding and spot welding. Okay, and uh, they are uh, basically, you know, more robots are being used because the scale of this activity has increased. You have seen the operational stock of the robots going from 250, just 250 to 23,000. That's essentially because the scale of activity of the automotive industry, because the automotive industry of today is not the same as the automotive industry of the 1990s or the earlier period. Okay, so more robots are used because the scale of the automotive industry has increased. Okay, so this is just the same figure in, so it doesn't give you any, any additional information. So it is exactly like what the Kenneth Plum has said. So, uh, so robots are not used in wide variety of industries. They are only being used in uh, in uh, automotive industry and even within the automotive industry only in two tasks arc welding and spot welding and more robots are being used essentially because the scale of that activity has increased now let's look at its effect on employment this could be captured by the density okay so i have worked out the density of robots in india china and the world of Okay, so uh, and for um, so if you look at India and this is density of robots per ten thousand employed persons. Okay, so in India's manufacturing sector, it has increased from about four to about fifteen now. So four robots per ten thousand people. Now you have fifteen robots per ten thousand people. Okay, now in the case of uh, China, it has gone up to from 15, 
So China in 2010 was like India in 2018. Okay, 2007, I'm sorry, 2017. Okay, they, I'm sorry. Okay, so they had exactly the same number of uh, robots, but it has gone up to 140. Phenomenal spike because of the phenomenal increase in China as a world factory for automotive and electronics, especially for electronic products. Okay, world as a whole, also uh, the robot use has increased essentially because of the use in China and Japan and the other countries that we talked about. Whereas in India, it has increased pretty slowly. Okay, and to, to, to it's still only about 15 and that is entirely restricted to the automotive industry. Okay, so this is basically the density of robots in other countries. So the countries which have got the highest is Singapore and Korea. Singapore is essentially because of electronics and you remember that the, it's a very small country of 4 million people. Okay, so there is a, already they are facing a kind of a labor shortage there. And they were making, they are offsetting this labor shortage through immigrant major industries in Singapore. Okay, Korea and then, so you can see the kind of a density. Okay. Now, how important is employment in automotive industry to total manufacturing employment in India? Okay, so the big, big bars here gives you in millions the employment in organized manufacturing sector, which is read as the SI sector. Okay, so if you take the latest year 2017 18, 15.61 million people are employed in the manufacturing sector in India, okay, organized manufacturing sector in India. The automotive sector accounts only for about 1 million, which is about 6.62%. And even within this 1 million, the number of people who are working in tasks such as uh, spot welding and art welding is very, very small. Unfortunately, we don't have those task-wise employment numbers. Even the NSSO or any, none of those data, you know, data sources will give you that figure, those task-wise uh, data, okay? But you can assume that, so more robots are used, it should not have any negative effect on manufacturing employment as far as India is concerned at the moment, okay? So that's, uh, that's what the study is actually trying to show. So a lot of the uh, discussion that is taking robots are coming, stealing jobs, completely exaggerated not borne out by evidence. You know, robots have been traditionally used in the automotive industry and within that in tasks such as, uh, uh, you know, art welding and sport welding, and you continue to do that, more robots are used because the scale of that activity has increased. Okay, so that's the at highly labor intensive industries such as paper, wood products, textiles, non-metallic food products, etc are the least automated they are not automated okay they may use more machines but they are not automated the most automated industries such as aut automotive industry rubber petroleum basic uh, are less labor intensive they are anyway see 1 million out of 15 million 6% of the total manufacturing employment so is that a big deal you know if they uh, uh, put a few robots so the effect of automation, read as the use of industrial robots, has only an insignificant effect on the quantum of employment in the Indian manufacturing industry. So that's the strong conclusion that I would make. Okay. Now, let me correct myself. Okay. Because technology is not remaining somnolent; it is very it developing very fast. Okay, I refer to the exponential growth of various kinds of technologies. Okay. We already have uh, uh, the automation uh, uh, and employment in textile and clothing industry. Now somebody referred to the ILO study. Okay, the ILO study also refers to this. So what happens if the auto, if the textile and clothing industry in India is going to be, uh, and if automation is going to diffuse into the textile and clothing industry and that will be really bad for India because that is one of the major employer of people, you know, within the manufacturing industry. A lot of people are engaged in food processing, in automation, 
uh, you know, in textile and clothing industry. Okay. And there is there are some set technologies which are being developed essentially to automate the process of making uh, the cloth. And one such technology is known as the SU, SU bot technology. Now, if you click on that, it will take you to a YouTube video which actually shows that the SU bot technology has now developed so much that it can make a polo t shirt without the use of a man. Okay, the polo t shirt which we wear, you know, can be made without. So, think about that. In, uh, think, now, India is a major manufacturer of polo t shirts, you know. Uh, uh, whether it's polo or whether it's crew neck, you know, uh, doesn't really matter. Okay, these are all being made in one of the clusters which we have in the south near Coimbatore called Tripu. Okay, so these clusters will be completely wiped out. A lot of labor is involved, you know, employed there. But the main thing is that this technology is now very, very highly priced. So only very few firms can afford it. Okay. And in fact, when you watch that uh, YouTube video, we don't have the time to watch it now, but you can do it at your leisure. You will see how, a, you know, just like a, you know, a, a, a factory line, you know, cloth making is extremely difficult. In the case of, uh, uh, you know, because there are four processes that go into making an item of cloth. First one is picking the item. Second one is aligning it. Third one is sewing it, and fourth one is disposing the thing. This is making robots much more intelligent. That it is possible for them to, uh, to develop these technologies so that all the other tasks, which are not like picking, aligning, disposing, etc., can also be, you know, uh, can also be. For instance, do you know that robots, even humanoid robots, those robots which look like uh, human beings, they cannot walk, you know, they cannot climb steps, they will fall down, you know. So the technology has not developed to that extent, but it's only a question of time when they, they, they are, uh, they, uh, they are uh, uh, you know, that technology is developed. So one step thing, you know, some of our very labor intensive industries in the future has the probability of getting automated. Okay. And another, so that's first one. The first one is artificial intelligence and, uh, uh, you know, and, and machine learning and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and that can increase the automatability of uh, various tasks, which we thought that they were not uh, automated. The second one is, you know, the number of technologies relevant to the development of robotics are improving in an exponential rate. And I'll just briefly talk about that now. Okay. So let me first talk about what are those uh, technologies. The first one is computing performance. You know, there is a phenomenal increase in computing performance. Now we are talking about I7 or whatever it is. I am not kept pace with, you know, uh, so the, the processing speeds are becoming so fast. And in mobile computing, we are now talking about 5G. Okay, hardly have we moved from 2G to 3G and, and, and now we are in 5G. And then improvements in electromechanic and design tools, numerically controlled machine tools, that's developing improvements in electrical energy storage. We're now moving to lithium ion batteries, which are light, which can store much more electricity. So our laptop computers with lithium ion batteries can work for a much longer period. Mobile phones with one charge can last the whole day. And, and so that will also make uh, automation uh, much more uh, severe. Improvements in electronics, power efficiency, exponential expansion, availability of local wireless digital communications, like I refer to the 5G thing, okay? Growth in, uh, growth in the scale and performance of the internet, okay? Broadband is diffusing so fast everywhere. Worldwide data storage is increasing, you know? And now, see, earlier we were talking about kilobytes, then it became, Gigabytes, now we are talking about terabytes, okay, and, and, and so on, and exponential growth in global computation power. So all these technologies, which are ancillary technologies, which are required for automation, are also developing fast, and that will lead to uh, the possibility of a lot of tasks getting automated in the future. Third factor is China's AI boom. 
China has got into this artificial intelligence and robotics in a very big way. Okay. And in fact, as I told you, it has now become a major consumer of robots. A lot of robots, they are actually making themselves. You know, they are not relying on outside firms. Their own companies are making those uh, robots. And when China makes something, they also make it much more cheaper. So you take that first point that I made some time ago, that uh, the, you know, the uh, ro robot use, uh, you, know, you know, will uh, increase and that will lead to a kind of, uh, um, you know, the robot use will increase and that will lead to a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of tasks which we thought were not automatable. People, you know, even medium and scale, me medium and small scale firms will also be tempted to buy these autom uh, automation technologies. Uh, and uh, so it's only a question of time. So the conclusions of my study should be taken with a pinch of salt in the light of these developments. The light of developments in artificial intelligence, the light of developments in this uh, ancillary technologies, in the light of developments of China getting into this whole thing. Because most of the patents in robotics, robots, robotics and Art, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, by, by increasingly by Chinese authors. You know, many Chinese companies have become very important, and the implication is that they will also make it very cheap. So it will these technologies will become very very much within the uh, what shall we say? Uh, you know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, these technologies will become very much within the within the uh, uh, reach of uh, medium and small scale industries. Okay. So I don't want to repeat my conclusions. You can go through these conclusions. The points are fairly straightforward. Automation at the moment is, at the moment when we are, uh, when we are speaking, in the, is not a big threat to manufacturing employment in India, but it can be a threat in the, in the future. Okay. And, and this threat has been accentuated by the COVID pandemic, because we see that a number of tasks uh, we would like because of social distancing, need for social distancing, factories can become smaller in terms of employment size because of the need to have less number of people working there. And, and many tasks can become uh, automated. And we are already seeing that in the services field a great deal. And that will also move to manufacturing. For instance, uh, you know, one of the things in India which were demanded very highly during the lockdown period was snacks. Okay. Uh, and within snacks, one of the items which are being demanded very much was biscuits. Okay. People were sitting at home and keep on eating biscuits. And all the major biscuit manufacturers in India have now automated their factories to quickly deal with, to ramp up the, you know, the production of their, uh, you know, increased, you know, to increase production of their, uh, uh, those items, because you can't employ people because of social distancing and other needs, you cannot employ people. So you, uh, you have uh, this one. Okay. So that's, uh, uh, you know, also going to lead to, uh, you know, so even firms and industries, which were, not very serious about using automation, will now start thinking seriously about automation and so on. So this is, this is all I have to say as far as this topic is concerned. <music>